Overloaded by fault warnings, the pilot overlooks the low power indication. Was this crew one that was very attentive and picked up this information very early? Were they very slow to pick up the information? We don't know. Were the demands so high that they were unable to, uh, to keep up with it? We don't know. Only Flight 447's black boxes could provide conclusive evidence. But now, Tony Cable discovers a worrying pattern to support Cox's theory. In 10 previous incidents of airspeed failure, the crews failed to increase thrust immediately. In quite a number of them, it's clear that the crews were very slow to get onto manual throttle operation. In five cases, crews did not take manual control of thrust for more than 60 seconds. For flight 447, that would spell rapid deceleration and the risk of a sudden stall. 10 to 15 knots would not be unusual. If you decelerate at a knot a second, it's 15 seconds. The aircraft could slow down to a much lower speed and you could approach the stall quite quickly in that manner at altitude. There is a good possibility um, that at some point in the last four minutes that there was a stall event. A sudden and critical loss of lift from the wings. But even in a stall, the aircraft can be saved. Tony Cable explains the standard recovery technique. The procedure is full thrust on both engines, reduce the pitch attitude, and the aircraft will then resume normal flight. By pitching the nose down, the pilot restores smooth airflow over the wings and escapes the stall. But Flight 447's pilots may have found themselves in totally unknown territory. If they were uh, in a condition that it fully stalled, oftentimes uh, when the nose breaks, they'll roll off on a wing. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a pretty uh, aggressive maneuver when the airplane does that. If one wing stalls before the other, the aircraft rolls violently to one side, more like a fighter jet than a passenger airliner. To recover from this stall, the Flight 447 pilot would require highly specialized skills. This is the National Aerospace Training and Research Center in Pennsylvania. At the controls of his advanced simulator is Colonel Paul Comtois, a former US Air Force F-16 fighter pilot. He believes that taking an aircraft to the extremes is a skill that only comes from direct experience. We don't fly around on autopilot a lot. We have a lot of, you know, hands-on stick time. Not only does it give you the experience to fly in that extreme maneuvering envelope, um, it gives you the confidence to be able to do it as well. The simulator has the cockpit controls of a passenger airliner. But unlike conventional simulators, it moves like a fighter jet, spinning on three axes to take pilots to the limits of human physiology. You learn not to believe your body, because your body will lie to you. Comtois is flying in the dark, with no visual cues from the outside world. Instead, he must rely on his instruments. I have flown on missions where I felt like I was in 120 degrees of bank, but I'm looking at that gauge and it's telling me I'm flying straight and level. Instructor Glenn King is about to trigger a violent maneuver, like the stall that may have hit Flight 447. Here comes a very high 4 degree pitch up, 50 degree pitch up attitude, the aircraft is rolling. The simulator sends Comtois into a head spinning roll at 35,000 feet. 
got to unstall the airplane. The nose must go down. He has to get the air flowing over his wings by ignoring his own senses and trusting the instruments. It's a mental battle because, yes, I am flying on that gauge, um, but, man, I don't feel right. He's regaining control, but the ground is coming up fast. I've got to be very careful for how much I pull back on that stick. The danger? He might stall again as he tries to pull up. He started his recovery. At, you can hear the buffeting now from the plane being loaded. You see how fast it is. Now the aircraft's starting to g load, starting to load up the G's. The airspeed's very high. That's a lot of altitude. And he's flying again. Comtois finally recovers control. But despite years of jet fighter experience, the Air Force Colonel lost 19,000 feet, more than half his altitude in just 45 seconds. Most airline pilots had no such experience. And autopilot means they do little hands-on flying. For Tony Cable, the case of Flight 447 highlights critical training issues. It has raised the question about whether the situation is actually being made worse by the increase in automation whereby crews uh, don't get a great deal of opportunity to manually fly the aircraft. Paul Comtois agrees. The more we automate, the more we need to get back to the basics of flying. You know, when, when I'm flying that fighter to the edges, I am physically hands-on the stick and throttle. Standard airline flight simulators don't have the freedom of movement to recreate extreme maneuvers. Stalling is not something actually that's taught uh, to transport category airplane pilots. We've gone from pilots who've had experience of uh, some of the more extreme maneuvers to pilots who very rarely see them. But the wreckage of Flight 447 suggests the pilots may have come close to saving their passengers' lives. We know that based on the impact damage that the airplane was nose up pretty close to wings level uh, with a high vertical sink rate when it hit the water. Did they somehow manage to get upright and level before running out of time? Without further evidence, this is one question the investigators can't answer. A year after the accident, the search for Flight 447's black boxes continues. This is what the official investigation is looking for. But Flight 447's black boxes stop transmitting location signals after one month. They're still lost in an underwater mountain range two and a half miles deep. The only way that we're going to find a complete and un total understanding of what happened to that airplane is if we're fortunate enough to get the cockpit voice recorder and digital flight data recorder. If the black boxes are recovered, they're likely to prove there was no single cause for the accident. In any of these accidents, there are chains of unusual circumstances. And it only requires one of those links in that chain to be broken to prevent it happening again. From the existing limited evidence, our independent team has linked together the possible chain of events. No single link is fatal in itself, but together, they provide the most convincing solution so far to the mystery of Flight 447.
Just before 2.10 a.m., Flight 447 flew into a 250-mile-wide Atlantic storm. A possible reason? It was hidden from the aircraft's radar by a smaller storm. We believe that the aircraft was probably in an area of turbulence which had been charging to fly. The next link in the chain. The storm clouds contained a rare form of water. What's possibly unusual in this storm is to have supercooled liquid water this high up in the atmosphere. Then, another unforeseen event. Flight 447's pitot tubes develop a problem. There is little doubt that the airspeed systems failed in some fashion, probably due to icing, and that the aircraft went out of control from that point. The automatic flight systems failed, forcing the pilots to take back control. They were faced with multiple warnings, multiple system failures at night over water. Uh, unbelievably challenging environment. In similar previous incidents, pilots did not take control of the vital thrust levers as is standard procedure. Crews uh, can be very slow to get onto operating the throttles manually, which is very essential, of course, to maintain a decent airspeed. If they lost too much airspeed, the potential high altitude stall would have been far beyond most airline pilots' experience. If you've never been there and you don't know what to expect, the results are going to be disastrous. But in the final struggle, it's possible that the crew almost saved their passengers before a second, and this time, terminal stall. They were not successful in uh, surviving the event. A compelling theory based firmly on the available evidence. But until the black boxes and their vital data are recovered, there can be no definitive proof. Aviation experts will continue to be troubled. We do need to solve it. Aviation does not do well with unsolved mysteries. We need to understand what happened that night out over the Atlantic. <laughs>